So the quote I'm going to read from is, um, is from Spurgeon. This is a, a collection of works on Roman Catholicism that was compiled by another man after his death. And it, it is helpful. It's called uh, Geese in Their Hoods. Um, but, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'll, I'm going to let the quote speak for itself, and I think it'll set the tone here somewhat as we're talking about Roman Catholicism today. And <laughs> so this is what Spurgeon said. He said, essence of lies and quintessence of blasphemy as the religion of Rome is, it nevertheless fascinates a certain order of Protestants of whom we fear it may be truly said that they have received a strong delusion to believe a lie, <coughs> that they may be damned. Seeing that it is so, it becomes, it becomes all who would preserve their fellow immortals from destruction to be plain and earnest in their warnings, not in a party spirit, but for truth's sake, our Protestantism must protest perpetually. Dignitaries of the Papal Confederacy are just now very prominent in benevolent movements, and we may be sure that they have ends to serve other than those which strike the public eye. A priest lives only for his church. He may profess to have other objects, but this is a mere blind. And then listen to this part here in particular, he says. Our ancient enemies have small belief in our common sense, if they imagine that we shall be ever be able to trust them, after having so often beheld the depths of Je Jesuitical cunning and duplicity, the sooner we let certain archbishops and cardinals know that we are aware of their designs and will in nothing cooperate with them, the better for us and for our country. Of course, we shall be howled at <laughs> as bigots, but we can afford to smile at that cry when it comes from the church who invented the Inquisition. No peace with Rome is the motto of reason as well as religion. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. <laughs> so obviously that's a, a very, very strong quote, and I uh, understood that it was a very strong quote when I picked it. But we need to understand that some, even though things change, they often stay the same, and things are not as different um, from Spurgeon's day as we sometimes think. Now, of course, we want to be loving and charitable, but we also want to be discerning, and we need to understand that that the Roman Catholic religion is still very duplicitous and they've, they still wish to um, suck Protestantism in through things such as ecumenism or whatever you have. And so we want to be discerning about these things and we want to um, know what the truth is, both in the positive, and so then as Pastor said, and when we see things in the negative, we can uh, discern between truth and error. So that being said, um, I'm going to have a start by reading the paragraph we're talking about today, and then I will go from there. Um, so let's turn to chapter 26, and we're going to read paragraph 4. Danny, could I get you to read, read it? Yeah, you can. You, okay. <laughs> I'll just go ahead. I got it in front of me. I'll read it. <laughs> I mean, no, no, I'm serious. I can't. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, it says, The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church, in whom by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling, institution, order, or government of the Church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalts himself in the Church against Christ, and all that is called Christ, God, in whom, sorry, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, so as we're gonna break, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna break this paragraph down, and I want to start by saying, in our church's constitution, there are two paragraphs of the confession of faith, which one does not have to hold to to be considered fully confessional. One is about infants, those who die in infancy, in chapter ten, and the other one is about the view of the Pope of Rome being the Antichrist. Now, personally, I hold to that view, but there are many, many good men and women, both in our church and in Reformed Baptist churches in general, who do not hold to that. And it, I think it's good for us to understand that. So today, I'm, my intention today is not to give a eschatological polemic for, for my view on it, but instead I want us to really examine two things. First, I want us to see the positive doctrine that Christ is the head of the church, because that's really what's most important. And then secondly, we're just going to do a bit of a general introduction to some of the claims that the popes have made throughout history because that will give us context of ourselves mm -hmm. and then you guys can look into views on the Antichrist in your own time. <laughs> but um, 
so that so that's really what we're going to do. We want to first we're going to look at the positive, and then we're going to look at the negative in contrast. So that's how we're going to deal with that today. So the first thing I want to look at is the doctrine that Christ is the head of the church. Now that may sound sound like an extraordinarily obvious doctrine, but if we look at the history of the church, we find out that that has not been the case at all, and that men have even died professing the truth that Christ is the head of the church. So it's very very important that we're rooted in that truth. Mm -hmm. So um, so I'm going to have us turn to a few scriptures to show, showcase this. And the first one I'm going to have us turn to is Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 20 through 23. Um, Doug, whenever you're ready. Okay. Yep, <laughs> whenever, you, no, that's all right. When it, whenever you're ready. Um, 20 to 23. Mm-hmm. Um, <coughs> It is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly spheres at his right hand, high above all government and authority, power and lordship, and every name that is named, not only in this, but also in the future world. God has placed everything under his feet and has given him his head over everything for the church, which is his body the completeness of him who fills the universe at all points. So, so here we're seeing this truth laid out. And if you look particularly at verse 22 of Ephesians 1, you see that it states that, that um, all things have been put under Christ's feet and have been given to Christ to be the head over all things to the church. So that's the, that's the first text we're going we're gonna to look at. Um, so the next text I'll have us turn to is Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll look at verses 20, 20 through 24. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their, to their own husbands and everything. So here, so, so here we're seeing the same truth being reinforced. The fact that, and we see the, the, the analogy here between marriage and between um, the headship of Christ over the church. And when it's really interesting how often egalitarians, they don't like the implication of this verse, and they've tried to go along to saying that, well, the, the husband is only... The source, because the word head, headship in the Greek does imply that, but it doesn't ex mean that exclusively. But then you say the implication of that, you mean that, would you say that Christ is only the source of the church and not the actual authoritative head of it? That obviously doesn't work. So, so the point here is that we see that um, Christ is the head of the church and that the church is to submit to Christ in all things. And then we see the analogy for marriage. Um, then I'll turn to one more text and then I'll, I'll take questions or comments. Um, the, the last one I have here in this section is Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him are all things. For by him all things were made, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominion, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of a body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Right. So we're, once again, we're just reinforcing our point here. And obviously these three texts are not exhaustive on the doctrine of the head of the church. We could go through many, many more. I've only chosen three for the sake of brevity and time. But it's really important that we see us rooted in that truth. So that then when we look at people who have tried to claim to be the head of the truth, or the head of the church, we'll see the contrast between what the Bible actually says and the claims that humans have made, such as the popes throughout history. Um, before we keep going any further, are there any questions or comments on anything we've talked about so far? Yeah, go ahead, Denny. It's interesting how um, 
the passage we just read, how it say, Paul writes for the end of that passage, he said that in everything he might be preeminent. That if there's any man, <coughs> Pope, or any other man or woman who claims to be the head of the church or whatever else, that means that they are devaluing Christ, that he's no longer preeminent, but they're making themselves mm-hmm. preeminent in all things. Mm-hmm. Which, very bad thing. <laughs> That's a light way of putting it. Right, right. That you see that that contrast. Uh, any other uh, any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. So so then so then when we've looked at we see that Christ is the head of the church. Now we're going to look at the negative, which is the claims of some of the popes throughout history. And I'm going to read just a few short experts of the Catholic Catechism. And the reason why I chose the Catechism of the Catholic Church is because it's the official Catechism of the Church. Because you always want to be um, objective, and you don't want to misrepresent what it what they actually believe so it's better to it's good to go to the source material as it were get it from the horse's mouth so that's why I chose to read a few out of this Um, so so this section that I'm reading out of is called the Episcopal College and its head the Pope so this is what this is what what they believe the Lord made Simon alone whom he named Peter the rock of his church He gave him the keys of his church and instituted him shepherd of the whole flock. The office of binding and loosing, which was given to Peter, was also assigned to the College of Apostles united to its head. This pastoral office of Peter and the other apostles belongs to the church very foundation and is continued by the bishops under the primacy of the Pope. They're talking about, they're mis- they have a wrong view of Matthew 16, verses 18 to 19. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But just a quick thing I want to point out, it is really interesting that they do admit that, that that binding and loosing or that authority was given to all of the apostles here, even though they claim it's primarily to Peter. Because we do see that the scripture does say that there was authority given to all of the apostles, and we'll see that today. And when you recognize that and you realize that it wasn't just Peter alone who was given authority, but all of the apostles, then all of a sudden their claims start to evaporate. So it's, it's, it's really interesting that they themselves have that in their catechism. Let me, let me keep going. I just have two more short paragraphs. The Pope, Bishop of Rome, and Peter's successor is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity, both of the bishops and the whole company of the faithful. For the Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church a power which he can always exercise unhindered. <laughs> Did it say that the Pope is the source of the unity of the church or something like that? It, if it's not in that paragraph, it is in this section, if you read it. What are the numbers of those paragraphs? Number 881 mm-hmm. and number 882. Now, obviously, there's a lot to pull out of that. I do want to point out that they use the terms Roman pontiff and the terms vicar of Christ. We're going to talk about what those mean in a little bit here. And it's the fact that if we explain what those mean, it's important to note that they use those terms themselves in their own catechism for the sake. Yes. So the Pope, Bishop of Rome, and Peter's successor is the perpetual and visible source and and foundation of the unity both of the bishops and the whole company of the faithful. For the Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. (laughs) You're right. I'm going to read one more. Could easily read quite a bit of these, but keep it limited to just one more. I was actually looking into a John Gill, uh, his exposition on Matthew 16, 18 to 19, because I was looking through the Catholic stuff with their uh, opinion on, like, the Luth. The, I forgot, like, what is it? Um, yeah, Matthew 16 and 19. Yeah, the bi- the binding and loosing. Yeah, the binding and loosing. Yeah, you're gonna be really good you're gonna be you're gonna be ready for 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 today. <laughs> okay, let me read this last one so we don't get bogged down with time. The Lord made Saint Peter the visible foundation of his church, 
he entrusted the keys of the church to him. The bishop of the church of Rome, successor to St. Peter, is head of the college of bishops, the vicar of Christ, and pastor of the universal church on earth. And that that dog is number 936, and you're welcome to look at the catechism if you want. No, I am. Okay. Um, so, so like, once the same thing, two things I just want to pull out of that last paragraph. We see that he cl they claim that Peter was given that authority. We're going to look at the biblical text they use. And the second thing is they use the same term again, Roman pontiff or, or vicar of Christ or God. So, so we're just starting to break, break, th break things down a little bit. Um, so the question is, that we need to answer is, is what they said true? Is it in the scriptures or not? So therefore, we're gonna tur let's turn to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 15 through 19. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. Okay. So there's a few things here that are really that we need to really point out. The first thing we need to point out is is before um, what did Peter actually profess to? And he pro he professed that Christ is the Son of the Living God, right. and this is very very important for the context of the verse. And the second thing we see, he says, And I will say that thou art Peter, and then upon this rock that I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the first thing we got to ask about is, what is the rock, or the chief cornerstone, that the church is built on? And there's... Pr oh, do you want to... Go ahead, Corbin. Oh, I was just going to say, it's the, this refers to, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, because he didn't say... Um, and, uh, and on you I will build my church, he right. says, on this rock. And this right. This being what Peter just said. So there's pretty much three potential uh, views, if we want to put it that way, three directions you can go for with this text. Well, the first would be that he's, he's talking that Peter is the chief rock. And obviously that's what the Catholics claim, and they claim that all the successors after Peter are also that. And that's why the popes would be the, the head of the church. That's the view that they articulate. The second view would be that Christ himself is the, is the rock. And then the third view, which is very, very similar to the second view, and the one which I think is correct, is that it's, uh, it's Peter's confession of Christ. That's what, that's what Christ means by this rock. What you just said, which of course in reality is the same thing as the second view of Christ himself, that that is the rock of which he, he Peter said it, and he's saying, Peter, you, God revealed this to you, and by extension of, of what you just professed, this truth of me, the rock, that is a, the foundation of the church. And it, it's really important, if you look at the Greek here, here, the word Peter in the Greek is Petros, which means a stone or a small stone. But the word that's used here is Petra, which means a large boulder or a bedrock. And so I think it's important to point out that, that the Greek word that's used in this text is different than the, wor the Greek word that's normally used for Peter. But I, and I think the really greatest context comes in if we examine this, this particular text in light of other verses about who is the chief foundation. And let me point out here that the apostles, all of the apostles, including Peter, are the foundation of the church, but they're not the chief cornerstone. And we'll, the text we're going to look at is going to show that. Um, because I mean, Peter himself wrote about how. Yeah, he talked about how all Christians are living are living stones, stones right? right. Okay. For the sake of, t we're not going to turn to that one particularly, but it is a very relevant text. But the text I want us to turn to here is Ephesians chapter two, nineteen and twenty. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Why don't you go ahead and read 21 and 22, John. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the church here is being described as a temple or a house of God that's being <laughs> built up. And we see the generations, as it were, 
are being built one upon another until the whole structure of the church is someday going to be completed. But then the question is, what's at the foundation? And you see here that, and the foundation is the apostles and the prophets, but then we see what the chief cornerstone is, which is Jesus Christ himself. So in one sense, can you say that the apostles are a foundation or the foundation of the church? Yes, you can. The scriptures do teach that, but they're not the chief cornerstone. That's Christ. And that's a very important fact to point out. And uh, let's turn to one more text to reinforce this point here, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses uh, 6 through 11. And before we read this real quick, let me just give the context. In the Corinthian church, there was strife and there was a party spirit going on. Among some were for Paul, some for Apollos, and Paul's talking about the work of the church being built. He's, talk, he's using the terminology of, you know, Paul planted, Apollos watered, etc. And so knowing what's going on will give context to the text. Corbin, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So verse 11 is obviously what we're talking about here is Paul's talking about how he planted or how somebody else built on top of it but he says what's the truest foundation what's the surest foundation F for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ so once again we're reinforcing that point that we saw in Ephesians 2 the chief cornerstone the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ and so we need to see that biblically any questions or comments so far Okay, let's turn back to Matthew um, 16 here. And we're going to look at verse 19. So, before we move ahead to verse 19, I just want to point out a few things just to sum up um, verse 18. So the, fir so, the reason why we would say that Christ is the, is the stone in verse 18, or the confession of Peter is Christ, is for three primary reasons as I see it. One, because the context of what Peter actually said, that Christ is the Son of the living God. Two is because of the Greek words that are used, the word Petra instead of Petros. And the third is because what we read in other parts of the New Testament. So if you take all that information you put together, I think it's very clear that Christ has to be the cornerstone or Peter's confession of Christ, which like I said is a very minimal difference. Um, but, it can't, but it's not Peter himself <laughs> exclusively. That's not what it's teaching. But then we come to the part which is verse 19, and I'll just read it again real quickly. And he said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever thou shalt bind on earth and bound in heaven, and whatever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the question is, what is, because here we do see that um, Christ is giving something to Peter. And so the question is, what does that mean? What does that, what does that mean in terms of the binding and the loosing, and what is the the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Um, now to sum this, now for the sake of time, I'll have to be somewhat brief on this. Now I believe, as many commentators believe, that, that talking about the, kings of the keys of the kingdom of heaven is talking about the preaching of the gospel. And turning, the effect of the preaching of the gospel will be, um, as it were, if God works in the heart of those who hear that gospel which is preached, they'll obviously go to heaven and then those who reject it will go. So in that sense, you could say it's the kings or the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And I believe, and I believe that these keys aren't given to Peter exclusively, but to all of the apostles, and I'll, I'll showcase that in a minute. And that's, uh, so many commentators, including John Gill, help believe that. Now, th now it's really interesting if you read Gill's commentary on, on this verse, and he was a master of um, rabbinic thought, that in the first century, rabbis would talk, you would use the term bi binding and loosing, and what it, would be, what it meant when it was used by them was to declare lawful or unlawful, or, to, or in terms of doctrine, to declare true or untrue. Mm -hmm. So, but then the question is, what does that mean? Now, I do believe that Peter here is being vested with authority as an apostle, 
I believe that he is being saying that he will have a teaching ministry which will be very influential. And we know that all of the apostles were promised by the Holy Spirit to be led in all truth. But it's not to Peter exclusively or to his successors. And I think a really important verse that points that out is if you turn over to Matthew 18, 18, where we see the same terminology. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. <coughs> yeah. So, now if, now if you were to examine this text in the enti this entire chapter in context, which we won't get into too much for the sake of time, you see that, that Christ is speaking to all of the apostles here. And that's very important. And we see the exact same terminology as Matthew 16, 19, which shows that, that the, 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 the binding and loosing, regardless of it is, is not just given sheerly to Peter. It is in one sense given to Peter, but not to him exclusively. It's given to all of the apostles. And I think that it is saying, I think Christ is saying that the, that the apostles did have authority in terms of doctrine, because they, like I said, they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I do believe that it was saying that they were having a teaching ministry, but it's not to Peter alone, and it has nothing to do with uh, papal premacy, as being suggested. So, just one question. So yeah. Would this um, also have basically then be related to, for example, Peter seeing the sheep being led down from heaven, and God saying basically that, that all animals are clean to eat, and also the letter in Jerusalem saying that these are... These are, you know, these these are the laws that you need to subscribe by. You know, don't eat food sacrifice to idols or whatever. But but not the other uh, ceremonial laws. So like th that would be sort of the same idea of the keys. That you could kind of say that as an implication. I think. Okay. I think circumcision is a good example, right? I think we're going a little afield here. Oh, what what <laughs> what Jesus is is speaking here? He's not speaking to the apostles. He's speaking, he's giving this authority to the local church. Yeah, in Matthew 18. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. Yeah, in Matthew 16, it's talking to the, in a universal yeah, church sense. Church. In Matthew 18, it's talking to the local church. Mm -hmm. right. Which, right. if the local church has the ability, like people of the local church have the ability to bind and lose, mm -hmm. and that definitely means it's definitely not limited to people. Right. Yeah, you want any further comment on that, Pastor? No, I, I just wanted to see that you know, he wasn't speaking to the apostles. As mm -hmm. apostles, he was speaking to the church mm -hmm. here, the local church, and its authority that's bestowed by Christ through the apostles to the local church. Sure. Mm. So, so um, any other questions on comments on that before we, we move forward a little bit? Okay. Well, um, so what I want to do here, yeah, it did get dark in here. Um, so the first thing I want, well, the next thing I want to do, do here is to walk through a few of the terms that we talked about that are used for, for some of the popes. And the first one I want to know, if, when, if, let's say you were to go and actually have a meeting with the pope, how would you, does anybody know, how would you address him? Father, Holy Father. Holy Father, right. Would I address him or how are you? Well, we, <laughs> yeah. we might not use that, but, it, but if what you were doing it. You supposed to be called? Yeah, <laughs> what he's supposed to be called. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, now obviously, <laughs> hey Frank, oh boy. Um, um, so the point here is that you would call him, if you did it the way you're supposed to, you would refer to him as Holy Father. And this in of itself is, is unscriptural or even blasphemous. So let's turn, to a, let's turn to a text here real quick. Matthew 23, verses 8 through 9. Okay, but you are not to be called rabbi because you have one teacher and you are all brothers and sisters. Do not call anyone on earth your father, because you have one father who is in heaven. Yeah, so we see that that that's not a scriptural or proper uh, designation that to refer to him as Holy Father. It's that he's usurping something that should be reserved to God alone. Because we're not talking about we're not talking about our earthly fathers or a dad. He's taking that as an official title, and that's the distinction we need to make here. Really quick, Joe, and that, that also, um, you might be reading this next, but mm -hmm. the term Holy Father is also used when Jesus is praying to the Father in John 17. Mm -hmm. So not only is he, are we calling him Father, but they're also the Holy Father comes from the mm. high priestly prayer, which makes it even more mm. I blasphemous. I think so. <laughs> right, yeah. And I think, yeah, that's right. many folks have called him so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, uh, yeah. And the next, the next one, which, because um, one of the ones we read in the catechisms is the term Roman pontiff. 
Now the word pontiff means priest, mm -hmm. and it's really interesting that if you read um, ancient Rome's history, that they had a college of pontiffs, which I think in a lot of ways is actually sim similar to the college of cardinals today. But and the chief the chief term was called the term pontifus maximus, mm -hmm. which is a term which has been used by the, is still used by the popes today. Mm -hmm. Now if you were elected in the Roman Republic era if you um, were elected to be the head of the College of Pontiffs, you were referred to as the Pontifus Maximus. Mm -hmm. It's the same term used by the Pope today. But when the Roman Empire came around, and not the, um, not the Republic any longer, that, that, that title became designated for the emperors. Yeah. And the emperors became the Pontifus Maximus. So you were both head of the state and uh, the head of the r Roman religion. And we see that term Pontiff goes mm -hmm. back all the way to ancient Babylon. Now we can't wow. get into that for the sake of time. Wow. But, it's in, but the exact same term, and it is used in the literature, If you, you can read it in multiple places, but you see that the term Roman pontiff, which they use, is uh, very prominent of itself. But I think the, ter the, the term that should stick out to us the most is the one we read in the Catechism, which is vicar of Christ. Or in the Latin, it's, uh, I might butcher this, vicarius fili dei, which once again is vicar of God or vicar of Christ. Now it's interesting, if you look up the word vicar, in many different dictionaries and get into terms for it because they would say that that term means representative of Christ. But let me... To, sorry. No. Like vicarious, vicarious from yes. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. So let, me read, let me read what the Webster's Handy College Dictionary says for the word vicar. It means substituting for or feeling in place of another. In the Webster's 2 New Riverside Desk Dictionary for the definition of vicar, um, once again, it means to, to take the place of or substitute for. So, which gets into, now the question is, well, Joe, are you getting into semantics here? Are you using the term differently than they would? Are you being unfair or unobjective? And that's the part where I think we need to look at what some of them have said throughout history, because I think the, the mystery will get taken away. Because I'm gonna make, we got plenty of time. Because um, I pretty much want to look at three claims here for the rest of our time, and I think this will go relatively quickly. Um, I want to show that they have claimed to be God, they've claimed to forgive sins directly, and they've claimed that they are above all other kings and rulers on the earth. Pretty bold claims. So, hmm. so I'm gonna first quote I'm going to read here. Like I said, these are going to go really quick. This is from an edition of the Canon Law. The Canon Law in the Gloss of Extravaganza of John the 22nd. This was initially used in the years 1316 through 1334. Mm. And this was used, this quote comes from, was continued in all the editions of the Canon Law up until 1612. And the official title was, Calls the Roman Pontiff, Our Lord God, the Pope. Mm. And then the next one, here's a quote from Pope Nicholas I, which is from the 9th century. And he said, this is what Pope Nicholas I said. He said, I am in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, hath both one consistory, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. Mm. I then being above all, seem by this reason to be above all gods. In a different place, that same Pope said, mm. Wherefore, no marvel if it be in my power to dispense with all things, yea, even with the precepts of Christ. So he's oh saying even, even what Christ himself declared. Oh and then I'll read. Is he saying that he and God are of the same substance? Yeah, I believe he is. Oh, yeah. Now, you yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll read it again. Sorry, Wherefore, no marvel, if it be in my power to dispense with all things, yea, with the precepts, even with the precepts of Christ. Now, I'm not going to read all the sources for this. They're listed on the sheet if you want to look at it later. Oh, yeah, so that's the Church Historians of England Reformation Period by Josiah Pratt. I'm not going to read the other sources. You're welcome to look at the sheet after the study. Um, let us scroll down. So this one is, um, this is about, this next one's from the Fifth Lateran Council, and it's referring to Pope Julius II. Now, Pope Julius II was famously referred to as the warrior pope because he waged war all throughout Italy. And when, um, when Martin Luther was a monk and he made his, his, his infamous pilgrimage to Rome, that Pope Julius was the pope who was in power at that time. 
So this is interesting. So this is what the, the, the fathers of the council said about him. He said, Take care that we lose not that salvation, that life and breath, which thou hast given us. For thou art shepherd, thou art physician, thou art governor, thou art husbandman, thou finally art another God on earth. And then, let me see. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, then let me read this another. Here's another short one from Innocent the Third, who founded the Inquisition and launched a crusade against the Albigenses. Not at all yeah, he wasn't. Um, he said, "The Pope holdeth on earth, the pl holdeth place on earth, not simply of man, but of the true God." Innocent the Third. I got just a f I got a few more on this sheet. Then the next one comes from Pope Pius IX, and if anybody knows anything about Pope Pius IX. He was the Pope during the First Vatican Council, mm -hmm. where they declared that the Pope was infallible in terms of doctrine. And this is what Pope Pius IX said, and this is in the 19th century, by the way, so this is a very, very, very modern mm -hmm. quote. I alone, despite my, un my one unworthiness, am the successor of the Apostles, the Vicar of Jesus Christ. I alone have the mission to guide and direct the bark of Peter. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's uh, blasphemy, referring to what Christ said about himself. And then, I'm going to read, this is what Pope Leo XIII said, and this is one of his encyclicals. You can go look this up if you want to read the whole encyclical. Um, this thought has been is a sort of deep concern to us, for it is impossible to think of such a large portion of mankind deviating, as it were, from the right path if they move away from us and not experience a sentiment of innermost grief. But since we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, he's referring to the papacy, not the church as a whole. If you read the context, you see that more. Um, I'm just going to read mm. two or three more on this sheet here. Um, and this next one's from Pope Pius X. He's from 1903 to 1914. So this is right before World War I. And he said, The Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself under the veil of flesh, and who, by means of being a common to hu humanity, continues his ministry amongst men. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. Does he teach? It is Jesus Christ who teaches. Does he confer grace or pronounce an anathema? It is Jesus Christ himself who is pronouncing the anathema and conferring the grace. Hence, consecutively, when one speaks of the Pope, it is not necessary to examine, but to obey. Mm. There must be no limiting the bounds of the command in order to suit the purpose of the individual whose obedience is demanded. There must be no cavilling at the declared will of the Pope, and so invest it with quite another than that which he has put upon it, no preconceived opinions must be brought to bear upon it. No rights must be set up against the rights of the Holy Father to teach and command. His decisions are not to be criticized or his ordinances disputed. Therefore, by di divine ordination, all, no matter how august the person they may be, whether he wear a crown or be, or be invested with the purple or be clothed with the sacred vestments, all must be subject to him who has all things put under him. And then two more short ones. Pope Pius XI, this is 1922, by the way, so this is really, really modern. He said, you know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God on earth, the vicar of Christ, which means that I am God on the earth. And then John Paul II, last one, this is short. This is, this is from an article in the Los Angeles Times. This one, last one's 1984. Yeah. 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 So when do they say, are, are, they, are they trying to say basically that it's an incarnation, that he's an incarnation, or like it happens at a certain point? I would say that they believe that, that when, you're, when you're ordained to that office, that more or less yet, you're not, merely, you're not merely an ambassador or a representative, but that you are in fact Christ or God. Yeah, so you are no longer whoever you were prior to that, you're... Yeah, and that's often, and that's the reason why oftentimes the popes refer to themselves in the we, which we saw that in one of the quotes, Leo the Thirteenth. That's actually been very common for them to speak of wow. themselves as we mm -hmm. throughout history. Wow. Yeah. And so, what does that make Cardinal Ratzinger? Is he un? Did he un become Christ, or are there I I have no idea. Yeah. Now, like, 
So like I said, now I'm sure that many Catholics would say that we're being unfair, but I don't believe we are what, because uh, I... What's the reference to John Paul? Uh, I'm interested to hear. What John Paul II said famously, he said, don't go to God for forgiveness of your sins, come to me directly. And that was, that was printed in an article of the Los Angeles Times. I think you can look the article up, actually. Yeah. Yeah. You have that little card I gave you? It's, it's, it's not with, I didn't have it with me, but. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah, but he, what did it, what did it, go ahead and, what did it say, Pastor? It's a picture of John Paul II on one side. And it says on the other, it says, the other, it says oh, yeah, right. follow the Pope and those cardinals with him. Your eternity depends upon it. Hmm. Right. So obviously, we see that they have claimed to be God, and they have claimed to be, um, hmm. they have claimed to forgive sins. I only have two more quotes, by the way, so uh, rest easy. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead, Denny. It is an Amazon reprint. This is um, the book called The Papal System by William Cathcart. He was a pastor of a Baptist church in Philadelphia in the 1800s, 1826 to 1908. And he adhered to the Philadelphia Confession, which if anybody is a student of church history knows that it's pretty much identical to our own. So he's very, very sound, and this is an excellent book because it really stretches, it really examines all the doctrines of the Catholic Church throughout history, and it gives a lot of context. The only problem is that this book is very hard to find today. Unless Amazon reprint. Yeah, unless you get an Amazon reprint. So these last, these last two quotes I want to read here is talking about how the popes have a uh, claim to... Uh, They've claimed to be ruler, this is called their temporal power. They've claimed to be above all of the kings or rulers of the earth, even unto this day. So that, because they believe that the only way of salvation is through the Catholic Church. And they believe that if you are a, indeed a good Catholic, you must be subordinate to the Pope. So the natural implication of that, even if you're a king of a nation, you're still under his authority. And that's what historically has been called the Pope's temporal authority. And so this is what Gregory VII said. Gregory declared that kingly and papal government must be compared to the sun and moon. The Pope's government is like the sun, filling the world with its power and glory. The dominion of monarchs is like the moon, diminutive in its life and derived exclusively from the mighty sun of the seven hills. His doctrine is that royal authority is ordained of God and should remain within its proper limits, subordinate to the papal power, which is sovereign over all. And this, and this is another thing, this is more direct from him. He said, Gregory VII said, um, I dispose from imperial, it ro wait, 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 wait. Mm, yeah. He says, this is when he's excommunicating the Holy Roman Empire, and he says, to show favor to him as emperor, Anyone who shows favor to him as emperor or king shall be ipso facto excommunicated. And those in the empire upon whom the election of an emperor devolves may freely elect a successor in his place. And such was the reverence in which this act was regarded that the German princes elected a separate, separate monarch. So he's saying that if he excommunicated this Holy Roman Emperor, mm -hmm. and he said anybody who gives a, allegiance or obedience to that said man is themselves excommunicated. That's an incredible level of power, goodness. if you think about it. Oh, mm-hmm. And I think I have just one more. Yeah. Yep, Sixtus the Fifth. And this is Sixtus the Fifth was um, he was around the time period of um, the Spanish Armada. So this is what he says to the ambassador of what, Philip II. What years are those? Um, this is this quote is was on 22nd of March 1590. He told the ambat this is the Spanish ambassador. He said the Pope is appointed by God as the superior of every other sovereign. And then my last one here is from Innocent the Fourth, and this was at the Council of Lyons, 1245, and he did issued a decree against once again the Holy Roman Empire, and he said. We hold on earth the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we do hereby declare the above-named prince who has rendered himself unworthy of the honors of sovereignty and for his crimes have been dis disposed from the throne by God and to be bound by his sins and cast off from the Lord, deprived from all his honors, etc., etc., etc. Once again, they claim that anybody who doesn't give allegiance to them can be excommunicated. 
Now, like I said, yeah. So just to sum up, they've claimed to be God or Christ himself. They've claimed to forgive sins. They claim to be sovereign over all the rulers of the earth. They said if we spent, we could spend weeks on this and get into all the details and show how that, that has evolved somewhat, but more or less remains unchanged. So I think, I think at this point I've made my point. So before we finish, does anybody have uh, comments, thoughts? I only got one. I feel like I have to wash out my ears now. <laughs> oh, very loud. Yeah. yeah. No, it's very it's it's dirty. Right. Oh, right. you mean, okay. yeah. You're like headphones. Yeah. No. Right. right. But, all right. So, um, I mean, one thing. Uh, I remember uh, listening to some report, man. I'm not sure how accurate it is, but because uh, uh, I think it was you, John, asking about how they see themselves, because you asked about the God when it comes to gods. Mm. Christ, regular Christ, that whole discussion, like five minutes ago or ten minutes ago. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah with yes. the incarnation. Yeah. 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 But part of it, if I, if I remember correctly from those lectures, part of it is because their view of the of Christology and view of the church, because like the passages we just uh, we read in the beginning, it talks about how Christ is the head of the body. So 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 if, so for the, the way at least some Roman Catholics and these and their, these Reformed guys interpreted them at least how they understand it is the fact that. Even though Christ is up there in heaven with his physical body and etc., that since uh, since there is a mystical union between the mm. church and Christ, in one sense, Christ is still present in the world through the church. Yeah, you know, if there's such thing as transubstantiation, then Christ's yeah. humanity yeah. can be in various places and can <coughs> reside in a man on earth. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's and so since there's this mystical relationship between the church and Christ, and since Christ is the he head of the church, mm. in one sense his body is here on earth, mm. so you can still you, you can have a earthly figure on earth who represents for Christ, mm. and then that's how the whole. Mm, okay. So at least according to one, it's one group of reformers I listened to on the topic. So if the pope was performing mm -hmm. the mass, would yes. he be eating the pope then? Is that no, he'd be eating Christ. <laughs> okay. Hmm. You bring up a, a good so point, though. Point, yeah. yeah. It raises so many, so many weird things. Well, in, in that in that moment, the trans in, in the mass, they're they're blessing it, and they are basically giving that power to that mm -hmm. bread mm -hmm. to become. So in, in that moment, no, technically, Jesus is there in the elements. Yeah, they're calling for Christ to come down. Right, right basically, yeah, pope. yeah. But if the Pope is is but, no, <laughs> but the whole point is that they're investing that. Right. Calling that power into the the elements. So in that moment, whatever they say about themselves, the bread is now Jesus, and that's how they you know they lift it up. And yeah, not like just his humanity, but also his deity. Right. Right. So, yeah. right. I'm sure they would make a distinction between the person of the Pope and the person of the mm -hmm. of Christ. Right. <laughs> as, as know, uh, but ultimately, it's a distinction without a difference. Right. Right. Yeah. Now you could say now what they would say is. Well, perhaps you Protestants are getting into the semantics of what the word vicar means, yeah. but that's why the that's why all the quotations are important. Right. When you get it out of the horse's mouth about what they've said about them, Whoa. that's yeah. where the context come. Right. So if and that's why it's so important to read all those because at that point you realize they're not talking about merely a representative or an ambassador of Christ or someone who's been vested with authority, but they're taking Christ's authority mm -hmm. as Christ Himself. They themselves said it. I don't mm. think the quotes are out of context. So that's why it's important. Can, can you speak to this too, Joe, where the Greek word that we, we render in English, anti, yeah. anti-Christ, can, does mean against Jesus Christ, but also can be rendered in the place of. It's yeah, it does, mean, it does mean that. It means mm -hmm. both. And obviously, this is, why I, this is why I personally hold that viewpoint that I do believe that the, right. the popes are the anti-Christ. Because if it's merely a Muslim leader, for example, he may stand against Christ, certainly, right. but he doesn't take the place of Christ right. in that sense. Mm. And I would also say, um, you know, and same if that was a communist or a secular leader or whatever have right. you. So, like I said, so, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe how I could have been deceived so. Yeah. They didn't tell you all these things. Well, no, that's sure. the thing. i got to sanitize. But I, I tell you, what, uh, a lot of, po you know, Catholic practice is based on a single verse made to fit the, you know, and uh, 
I know I was, uh, what drew me was I wanted, you know, you know, some of the reformed divines that I'm reading, they speak of, you know, seeking to have a conjugal relationship with, with Christ, with God. That's what I was seeking, you know, that, that intimate relationship, and I was fooled into thinking that the, uh, you know, transubstantiated, you know, that I was incorporating Christ mm -hmm. into me. Well, a Roman Catholic and, and, can say, uh, you know, it, it mean it in a very carnal sense when they take the elements, I have Christ in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and uh, another thing, but, you know, uh, all kinds, you know, I had all kinds of objections, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I was practicing Catholic, I had all kinds of objections, but somehow I just, you know, was blinded by just that, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, well, I can't think of it. Um, but, um, you know, on ESPN, you know, all these Catholic Jesuit <laughs> scholars, you know, I heard one, uh, you know, speak, one of them's debated with, you know, uh, and, uh, but he, he mentioned, you know, we are, we are, and I heard this from Father Mike at St. Bernard's, we are, we are to be divinized, you know, not only the Pope, but we ourselves can actually become God, you know. And mm -hmm. I thought, no, 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 that's not what my body, you know, because I was fairly well grounded in Scripture and mm -hmm. it just kept coming. I'm, I'm glad I had grounding in Scripture because I could recognize things that contradicted that, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think another. Uh, I think, you know, where you talk about people being misled. Uh, another um, uh, uh, facet that uh, caused me to retain this is, uh, uh, you may have, you know, heard this uh, uh, organization called the Coming Home Network. And uh, that was actually founded by Scott Hahn, you know, the chief Catholic apologist today. And and uh, was once a Presbyterian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, that's the whole thing. This organization, uh, in a short period of time, you know, within a couple decades, uh, at last count, I'm sure it's far more. Not the last time I checked, you know, there were 700, 700 prominent Presbyterian, Baptist, and even Reformed pastors that had seen the light and come home to Rome, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about, you know, seduction and, and being deception on a mass scale, you know. I thought, well, this, this has to be, you know, I mean, it's Scott Hahn, and, you know. <laughs> and and uh, so there you have it, you know. And uh, uh, so there's, there's a lot of ammunition that keeps people in, you know, Deception that way. Yeah, in Sault Ste. Marie, there, there are three Roman Catholic churches in a town of 15,000. Mm -hmm. Well, Sault Ste. Mary, you know who the patron saint of the city is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they had a, a big uh, reader board outside in front of one of the <laughs> churches said, Come back home yeah. to Rome. Yeah, it's come back yeah. home. Yeah. Home to Rome. That was supposed yeah. to be yeah. home. home to right. yeah. It might have been a passage that says, I will not lose any of my children, or whatever that is from Revelations. <laughs> yeah. She will not suffer loss of children. There we go. That right. One. But then again, if you read, it's so. Then you go back and read, like the chief it's architect, and then there's, you know, um, when you read his home to Rome, uh, how he came home, oh, it, it's pretty shallow. <laughs> You know, he was uh, beginning, uh, you know, he, he just gotten out of seminary and was a, a, a freshman preacher. And uh, for lack of sermon material, he went back to, uh, for, for some reason, he started uh, not at all thinking of Rome, but he started reading some of the early church fathers. And actually, a lot of the writings of the early church fathers are pretty right on. You know, uh, have all kinds of hymns that they're devoted to some of these. You know, <laughs> and uh, so he was giving these sermons on the early church fathers, and then somehow or other he 
one he was just in a, a, a happened to be in a, a location or a church where he heard a mass being he went around the corner went into the sanctuary and he was just bedazzled well this is everything I've been reading from the church fathers it's all here the, the bells and the smells and the, the whole you know the whole thing you know mm -hmm. he was bedazzled by it and started proselytizing other people you know to that you know right yeah I, I had a pastor friend in Sault Ste. Marie Pentecostal pastor yeah and we met for for lunch occasionally mm -hmm. And I was trying to feed him some good books, and I mm -hmm. did. And, and then uh, he started reading the Church Fathers. Mm -hmm. And he went from being a Pentecostal to being a part of the CEC, Catholic Apostolic Church, or e Catholic um, Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. And he's full blown in Rome now, but mm -hmm. that's his pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it seems like there's a weird, well, unfortunately, like I say, if it, if it actually today represented what it was really, that would be a whole other thing, but it ain't, you know. Right. Well, Francis Schaeffer's son, Frankie, yeah. Yeah. Went, went into Eastern Orthodoxy. Oh. Yeah. Is, 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 there, is it just me, or does there seem to be some weird movement from, like, char charismatic to Roman Catholicism? I feel like... People make that jump very easily. Well, the ecumenical oh. movement is, yeah. is part of the trail they take. Okay. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Yeah. So, As Joe was saying earlier. I'll make a, this is a good point for some closing comments. So if we remember what Spurgeon was talking about in his quote, this is a big reason why I opened with it. In his day, well, there was a movement going on called the Oxford Movement, yeah. where they were bringing all the ritualism and the liturgy right. and the incense and all of that. They were re-Romanizing the Roman or the English. Anglican Church. Thank you, Denny. Mm -hmm. Which obviously has still been going on to this day, and it's been very, very successful. And as that communion has gotten more liberal, many of those priests have jumped ship to Rome. Um, if you even Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, the one who you just said, mm -hmm. he was he's no longer Pope. He's the Pope Emeritus. He created a special branch or ordinary mm -hmm. for those Anglican priests yeah. so that, he, that they would be allowed to convert to Catholicism and be priests even though they were married, which traditionally isn't Catholic. Yeah, see, there again, that was another foundation of my belief. I you know, got into the Oxford <laughs> movement and mm -hmm. how enlightened all these people are. Yeah. And John Henry Newman and, mm -hmm. and Pussy. Owned the Protestant theologian and scholar becomes the chief apologist of his time for the well I, I gotta take the leap because that's where this is heading and and his uh, his uh, one of his big tomes is the you know the evolution of the faith uh, the faith keeps evolving you know it evolves it isn't mm -hmm. <laughs> just written on tablets yeah and the written word of God it evolves you know and uh, so there again, you know. Right. When the prominent people like that, you know, they must, you know. <laughs> well, there's the appeal of antiquity. Yes. 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 Yeah. The appeal and and mysticism too. Mm -hmm. So and so and then mysticism. yeah. And then here's my closing thoughts on this. That same type of thing that Spurgeon was warning about about how pro Protestants need to protest perpetually and be aware of what they're doing. That applies to us today. And obviously, since after World War II, the big, the big event that happened was the ecumenical movement that was launched after Vatican II. Mm -hmm. And they've been very, in a lot of ways, they've been very successful at Protestants or evangelicals' perception of the Roman Catholic Church has softened quite a bit, yeah. a lot. Mm -hmm. And another big movement, the two movements they've done to really be successful at is one, the ecumenical movement, and two, as you said, Corbin, was the, the charismatic movement. Oh, yeah. And that, because that really, um, mm -hmm. it's really created a lot of theological bridges between evangelicalism and Romanism. Mm -hmm. And if you look up, if you Google the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, which is yes. a movement that every pope yeah. has sanctified, you see that they, yeah. they're they using that to try to woo Protestants mm -hmm. back to Rome. And you see that, and if you want to really get into some of that, um, yeah. some of that work they've done, I would recommend looking up the document Evangelical and Catholics Together, like men and Sproul and MacArthur stood against, but even somebody like J.I. Packer, who did read some pretty good books, yeah. he signed it. Um, also, right, and Bill Bright, who's the uh, oh, Campus Crusade for Christ, Kurt. Yeah. Is that the one you were in? Yeah, yeah same same organization. 
Um, what's the name of the man who, um, he was in Nixon's staff, and he... Uh, Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson. He's another, he was very prominent evangelical. He went to prison after Watergate, became an evangelical. He signed that, evangelical and Catholics together. His wife was a Catholic. His wife was a Catholic. Mm. And... Um, a lot, lot more. The Manhattan Declaration is a more modern one. Mm -hmm. We're saying, and this is really the subtlety of it, they'll take causes like abortion or yeah. the opposition to homosexuality, mm -hmm. which are good causes, which we do stand against, and they use that to try to build bridges. And that's mm -hmm. where the discernment comes in. Yeah. Yeah, and, then, yeah, and then you have, you have men such as, um, mm. obviously, um, Billy Graham called the Pope the greatest moral leader of our age. I think that was John Paul II he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was... Um, Man, Crystal Cathedral guy. Um, Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller. When he was going to build the Crystal Cathedral, he actually went and got the plans for, for the building project approved by the Pope at that time. Yeah. And uh, we could give many, many more examples, but I won't. Uh, but the point is that we need to be dis discerning. Um, we need discernment because th even though their tactics have changed somewhat over periods of time, their goals have not. And we need to be aware of that. And the good thing is if we go through church history as a study, there's going to be times where it's going to be appropriate to walk through some of this material. Yeah. Um, if we do the, for example, if we get to the Reformation, we're also going to do the Counter-Reformation, and we'll actually get to talk about Jesuits. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever has it. Uh, responded to that poll that was sent by email and via <laughs> and text message too. It's okay, I understand. Like, you can forget. I forget things easily myself. But it would be very nice <laughs> if you respond to that poll sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean... Are you going to ask for show of hands who haven't? Ooh. Well, okay. I was going to say, everyone has everyone, everyone eyes <laughs> except for Vinny and uh, raise your hand. I've only razzed you every week about it, Holly. <laughs> Okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, there have been some people respond, which is great, but like if like more people could respond, it'd be better. Mm -hmm. That way we can, we can just see like what people are thinking. Right. And I think so we're going to do the history, but still. And I think we're also um, planning on an apologetic study, which will be a separate day, yes. and, that'll, and that won't be nearly as long as the church history one, but it'll be a good opportunity for us to cover some of the material for Roman Catholicism in there mm -hmm. as well. So the details of those things are still pending. We're still working that out. It's going to be Denny and Nick and myself mm. working with Pastor Nutter on that. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, some stuff for the future. But I'm going to close this out in prayer, and then we can uh, talk as we will. Lord God, we, we thank you that your scriptures are so clear and that we're, we're also thankful that your Holy Spirit is the one who's opened our eyes to truth and kept us away from error, Lord. We can take no credit for ourselves. So, so Lord, even though we wish to have a charitable spirit toward um, mm -hmm. those who are within the Roman Catholic Church, Lord, we also wish to um, take a stand for truth where necessary. So we ask that you'd give us wisdom about that. We mm -hmm. ask that you would be work, work in our hearts so that we would be, we would be humble and that we would, um, that we would stand up for your scriptures in the manner in which you would have us to do it. So we ask for your help in these things, Lord. We ask that you'd continue to bless our studies and ministries in the church going forward. Lord, you've been more gracious to us than we could ever ask or have hoped for. So we thank you for these things, and we ask that you'd continue to not just grow our church numerically, Lord, but grow us in grace and grow us in maturity and usefulness as a church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Things in Jesus' name. Amen.